One of the things I really love about being an academic is being able to come to places like this and hear great talks like Ed's and geez, everybody. Um, last semester, I had the honor to go to uh, uh, the Middle Eastern Technical University in Ankara. And I was working there with a couple of people. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we did. Um, so we started looking at, well, the, 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 the hist my history with these people is we looked at things that, that had to do with pitch. And so we started going out and making some measurements of pitch and interviewing some, some people and recording what they were doing. And that rapidly changed. Because what happened was whenever we were talking with these people, we'd ask them about their history and how they learned stuff and who they, you know, who they thought were their teachers. And, and they would say things like this. There was always somebody in everybody's life that inspired them to do things. And so I need to tell you what this means. So there's three words in the, in the title here that aren't English. Makam, Perde, and Seir. So I need to tell you a little bit about what each of these is. So makam is, is it's, well, if you know what Indian music is, it's kind of like a raga. It's a form on which you improvise. It's got note constraints. It tells you what pitches to play. It tells you sometimes what direction. It tells you how the notes relate to each other. It gives you motifs to play around with, and it gives and they have larger scale structures. So it's a, it's a comprehensive kind of uh, body of, of uh, well, things which you, you use to structure your improvisation or, or your composed pieces. Um, perde is the part of that thing that has to do with pitches. Now, pitches can be conceived in many ways. They can be conceived as isolated uh, in isolated frequencies. Um, the, the conception here tends to be that it's a blur in the histogram. So there, there are pitches that could take on into different values at different times. So maybe think of instead of a, the pitch of C and the pitch of C sharp, you'd have a blur of those things. Um, but Perde tends to have to do with pitch. Seir, that's the more complicated one. It, uh, you know, when you ask someone to tell you what they mean when they say, oh, I, I tell what the makam is of a piece by listening to the sayir. Okay, that's a typical comment. And then you say, well, what is a sayir? And they tend to tell you things about motifs and how different things relate to other things. And they'll often say something like, oh, I listen for this. And when I hear that, then I know it's in the Husseini makam. And when I hear this other thing, I... Um, when you try to get them to be specific about it, they don't really give you much satisfaction. You know, that shouldn't be a surprise, right? We were attending a rhythm workshop fairly recently, and I remember there was a session on what is rhythm, and, and a bunch of academics couldn't agree on what even rhythm was. So how are these guys going to agree with what Sayer is? As we were doing this, um, it occurred to us, it, is it really true that just by listening to the, to the makam, they could, they could tell, just by listening to the piece of music, they could tell what makam it was in? Now, I, I don't mean to disbelieve them. I mean, I suppose you could imagine in a case in which they were just sort of bluffing and, and making it up. But, but, but they have lots of extra information. They, they see the performer right there. They maybe know what village or what town the performer comes from and maybe what music they listen to in that town and, and perform. They know, um, maybe they know the piece itself. Maybe it has lyrics. Maybe, I mean, there's all sorts of extra musical information that you don't really think of as just by listening. So we decided to test this. And so that's the, the, first, of our, the first of our experiments. What we did is we basically took a, a collection of pieces that we know to be in a given makam, and then asked our listeners if they could tell us what makam it was in. And because I'm sure you're curious, the answer is yes, they can do this. And then we had, were confronted with the interesting question of what aspects of the sound then 
are they listening to in order to be able to do this feat of cognition? Now let me tell you, let me show you a little bit about what makams are. Okay, so here there's a, there's a traditional system that describes how these things work. This is what they teach you at the conservatory. Um, it's a system that was created by three guys, RL, SD, and AEU system, so I don't have to pronounce their names. <coughs> and it consists of a collection of things like this. There's two of them over on the right. One of them is the uh, Husseini Makam and the Ushak Makam. And the, you know, there's some things that aren't, it's like Western notation, but it's not. On those, the, that's not a typographical error. That's telling you that that particular note is a, is a particular distance away from the one you would expect to be there. So that this, re this feat of recognizing what makam something is in, it's like distinguishing between these two things, right? You hear something and say, oh, is it the top one or the bottom one? Sort of like you might imagine, oh, well, it's a major scale or a minor scale I'm listening to, probably something that most of you could do without much thought. Except the thing about the makams is there's a lot of them. So here's about a third of the makams that exist. I mean, there's tabulations and collections of such things. You end up with about 100 or 120, depending on how you're counting. And here's the 32 that we encountered during the course of this study. Some of them we initiated our, the encounter by asking people to perform in these things. Some of these were uh, answers to our questions about what Makam's things came in. So I'm not going to be able to tell you much about the details of how this works. It's, it's, a, lo it's a large, complex body of music theory. Um, but this is how the conservatory, how the art music of Turkey, conceives of its music. And so we're asking the question now. Um, okay, okay, so here's the, the, the theoretical construct. You imagine a 53-tone equal-tempered scale. Each, that, that's, each note in that scale is separated by a, a particular kind of musical comma. But you don't need all those notes. That 53 is way too many. So it turns out that with 24 of them, you can get pretty darn close to all of the different mock-ups. And here's an example. These are measured data. The, the colored histogram here is measured data from a particular performance. The black lines are just set there as being the official pitch that those things ought to have. And so you can see that the root here at zero, I've used the same notation here. The root here at zero is you know, uh, at zero, and it's pretty close to like, like a Gaussian kind of thing. Some of them are, this one's maybe a little bit off. You might imagine that people would argue about what pitch this really ought to be. So one way that people might be telling what makam a given performance is in is that they might be considering pitch relationships. I mean, this, is this how you do a major minor? Right? I mean, you know that the difference between a major scale and a minor scale is a, well, the third's a little bit off, right? It's a semitone off. Is that how you distinguish major from minor? It's a way that you might do it. But is it, so we call this the perde hypothesis, the sort of pitch hypothesis. That is, maybe what they're doing is they're listening to the pitches that are occurring in that piece of music and using those pitches, they are then inducing which of those many makams they happen to be lying in. That's certainly a reasonable hypothesis. It turns out that that's not what anybody says. What they tell you is that, and here's a quote from a paper right back in the signal. Um, it's more complicated than just pitches. It's got to do with temporal motion. It's got to do with the rhythm of the way the things are, the makam is played. It's got to do, and this is, so there's these motifs which people listen to, certain intervallic relationships, modulations, cadential points coming after stereotypical motifs. And this is the way people tend to conceive of this. So we, what we thought we were doing 
was building an example where we would say, leave the pitch structure intact, but scramble around all the stereotypical motifs, conventional points, modulations, and develop, sh shuffle all them around. And when we shuffled them around, we would expect the person to listen and say, oh, that's not a makam, maybe. Or maybe they'd say, uh, oh, well, that, you know, that's a different makam than the one we thought we were synthesizing. Or maybe they'll get it right. That is to say, maybe they can use only pitch information to, to answer this question. So let's, let's, let's prove this. So here's, we, do four, we did four experiments over the course of this past semester. And the first one establishes that, yes, indeed, it is possible to accomplish this task. It's hard. There were people who should have known better, that is, who thought they could do this task, who couldn't. And we ended up with three experts, expert listeners, who could correctly identify our, our, our collection of known mock-ups. And those were the ones we invited to participate in experiments two through four, because those are the ones that, that would help us distinguish these two hypotheses of the pitch-only hypothesis or the more-than-pitch hypothesis. Um, so let me just for, for, for a second, because may, I don't know whether you've, how many mockums you've heard here, but let, let me just play you a tiny piece of one of these things. Uh, oops, oh, I don't have the. That's the, thing, the long one. Oh, the long one, yes. sorry. So this is, this is the performance that we modeled our Husseini Makam after. And what we did, because we want to do things to control the, how the, these pieces are built when we present them in experiments two through four, we built essentially a synthetic version of this piece. So the synthetic version is, uh, is uh, here. So what we've preserved is the pitch and the, and the time. But we've done this in this resynthesis, resynthesized method because we later want to manipulate it. And now that we have it in sort of a MIDI file format, we can play with these, the structure of the piece. Um, so how did we do that? Well, I don't know that it's, it's worth spending a whole lot of time doing that. We essentially, we use the Tarsus Yin um, pitch extraction, that's the little blue dots there. We then built a, a hidden markup model that located the best set of uh, eight pitches, because you know, that tends to be the number you have, and throughout, and those give us the red lines, which you can see are a form of a pitch extraction from these monophonic uh, pieces. So much like what um, Emily was doing the other day. Um, so the first experiment was quite simple from our point of view and from the point of view of the, uh, of the listeners. Essentially what we did is we emailed them six, once they'd agreed to do this, we emailed them uh, six of these synthetic toxemes, these re reproductions of the toxemes, and you know we hid the names of them stuff. And we ask just one question. What Makam is this thing in, if any? We want to give them the opportunity to say, this is, just doesn't sound like anything. So here's the result from our three, three experts. The Makam that we intended, that we believed it was in, 
and what our three experts said. And you notice there's quite good agreement here. Um, remember, there's 120 of these things that they could be answering. If they, asked, if they answered at random, you would expect none to be correct. So they are not answering at random. And in, and in fact, this, this, this Isfahan Ushak thing that two people said, well, you know, there's, if you start looking closely at what you see in these pieces, you can kind of understand that by the structure of these particular mockums. That is to say, they're fairly close. The point being, they can do it. So now what we did is a series of experiments. We scrambled the notes around. One way, we just played them all backwards. One, we uh, literally scrambled them. We used a, a Markov chain with one, uh, one state, a Markov chain with three states. So uh, what these do is they destroy the temporal structure. <coughs> When you do that, what you get is something like this. So now there were, what's that, 14 of them, and here's the answers. And what you see from here is there's more confusion. There are things that people kind of just inexplicably get wrong. But people are able to, on average, get these things way, way more than chance. Um, you know, the, in other words, so what this tells us is pitch is all you need in many situations to find the makam of a piece. This was very unsatisfying to our, to my collaborators because it contradicts what our experts were telling us. So we did one final experiment where we took two Mockhams together. We took the pitch structure from one Mockham and grafted it onto the rhythmic structure of the second Mockham. So now there's two right answers, if you think about it. They might be listening to the pitch, which of course we know is enough to determine the Mockham or they might prefer the one that has to do with the temporal motion. It takes a little more looking at this to understand what it means, but in four out of the eight cases, they chose the temporal structure, the sayir. In two, they chose the pitch, and in two, things got confused and, and there was no conclusion. So, think about what this means. In, it's enough to identify the makam of a piece just to have the pitches. Essentially, the histogram of the piece is enough to do it. But if you give people a choice between a pitch set and a set of temporal motion, they prefer, well, two to one plus some mistakes, they prefer the one that has the sayir, the temporal motion. So, I think I just said this, pitch alone is enough. That was a surprise. Nobody really expected that. Um, but with that said, when the two, out, two components conflict, they disprefer the pitch, the pair day method, and they choose more or less, m much of the time, they choose the temporal motion. If you want to think of this in terms of rhythm, sayir, remember I couldn't get a good definition of sayir. It's got to do with motivic development. It's got to do with rhythm. It's got to do with cadential passages. They prefer the, the, the rhythmic, rhythmic aspects, the, the temporal aspects of this dominate the pitch aspects when they both are there and when they conflict. And so really, both elements are crucial. So that's my talk. <laughs>